Hey guys, this is Jeff Stanick with Figure It Out Baseball. We've got a really good Figure It Out Baseball podcast today that I'm truly excited about. We've, we're being joined by Graham Sykes today. He is the recruiting coordinator at Michigan State, of course, in the Big Ten. Uh, I'll give you a quick background on Coach Sykes before we jump into questions with him. Uh, he is a native of Independence, Kansas. He played collegiately at Liberty University, a very good Division I school in Virginia. I uh, graduated from Liberty in 2002. He got his first baseball coaching job at Independence Community College, a junior college in Kansas. He was there in 2004. 2005, he was an assistant coach at Nichols State, a Division I school in Louisiana. In 2006, he got the recruiting coordinator job at Young Harris College, one of the best junior colleges in the country. Uh, they have since tra uh, transitioned to be a four-year school, but at that time they were a junior college, and, and uh, Young Harris is located in Georgia. 2007, he was an assistant coach at James Madison, a Division I school again in Virginia. Then from 2008 until 2010, he was the volunteer at Notre Dame before getting the job in the spring of 2011 at Michigan State, where he's been since. Uh, coach Sykes, uh, very much appreciate you spending the time on the podcast with us today. I'm excited to get into it with you. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Appreciate you having me. Um, I like to start usually with something that, that stands out from people's bios. And for you, you know, obviously you, you jumped uh, around to, to a bunch of schools, which is kind of what, uh, kind of my path as well. Uh, when I started coaching, I, I always felt like I needed to kind of move around from place to place either to get, uh, you know, more responsibility or, or be at a higher level or, or whatever it may have been. But now you've been at Michigan State from 2011 until right now, so this will be your 10th spring, 11th spring actually, this will be your 11th spring at Michigan State. Uh, just kind of curious as to your path and and why you kind of jumped as much as you did and then now why you've been at the same place for a while and, and just sort of the dichotomy, I guess, of go, you know being at some place for a year and then going somewhere else and going somewhere else and now having a chance to sort of to be at Michigan State and kind of build up what's there now. Uh, just kind of curious about how that experience was for you and why it, it kind of went like it did for you. Well, that's a, that's, there's a lot in there, um, and it could go uh, probably in, in a long answer, but that's to, time, keep man. It, to keep it as succinct as possible, I, when I got out of college, I didn't know what I was going to do. I, I graduated with a degree in education, and I didn't really want to teach, but uh, I, I didn't even know coaching was an option, and um, so I went to uh, I went to work, actually, in the corporate world for a year, and I didn't like that at all. Um, and at, at the end, it was actually about 10 months. At the end of those 10 months, I just said I was going to resign, and I actually moved to Idaho, um, Boise, Idaho, and I took a job uh, at an elementary school in Boise, Idaho, and just thought I would try that out. I thought Boise was a nice town. Um, which is why it got me to go there, and, and uh, I spent the year there, and at the probably about halfway through that year, I realized this is not what I want to do. And so I, I actually um, talked to my old college coach, and I said, what, 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 uh, what is this coaching thing about? And he said, hey, if, if you want to do it, I think you'd be all right. You know, like, just start sending out emails. So I sent out, I don't know, 300 emails and I got two responses and one response was from the junior college coach in my hometown of Independence, Kansas um, and the other response was from uh, Mark Johnson, the head coach of Texas A&M and his response said um, we don't have anything, thanks for reaching out. So those are the two responses I got and the guy at Independence said I can't pay you but I'll let you coach here so that's what I did. And so when I started there it wasn't really my intention. I had no intention, really, other than just trying to be a good coach. But uh, about four months after I started at Independence, um, I had taken the sophomores to a showcase, and a, uh, a guy named B.D. Parker, who was the coach at Nichols State at the time, saw me at this showcase and said, hey, I'm look I just lost my hitting guy. Uh, you'd be interested in coming down. I said, yeah. And he said, when can you get there? I said, tomorrow. So, I, like, that was my first Division One job, and for me, you know, I felt like a move up. And um, so I was in Nickel State that year. At the end of that year, he retired, and so I was left to figure out, okay, well, where where do I go from here? And um, 
uh, a guy by the name of Rick Robinson, who was the head coach, Young Harris. Um, I, I can't remember if I reached out to him or he reached out to me, but um, they were, at that time, um, they were just a, a, a factory of players. And even he, his philosophy was to push coaches, too. So he said, you come two years, and then I'll, I'll try to help I'll get you a job somewhere. And um, so I went there. And that was, I think... Yeah, that was probably not, I think. It definitely was my big break because he was an excellent coach. Uh, it was an excellent team. Uh, he taught me as much as as much in one year or a year and a half as I probably learned in maybe eight to ten years uh, elsewhere. Um, and then he worked you so hard there. He said, you stay no more than two years because you won't be able to handle it. And he was right. And at the end of the year, I said, I think I need a division. I need to try to get another job. And so, um, then I went to, uh, James Madison. And then at the end of that year, uh, I was actually going to stay there. I actually got a promotion there and that was my, you know, I, I really liked it there and I was going to stay there. And, <clears throat> uh, Dave Schrag, who's now the head coach at Butler, he had gotten a Notre Dame job, and a friend of a friend told him that that I, you know, our, he needed a catching coach, and a friend of my, one of my friends, do had played for him and put us in touch, and that he offered me a job, and that's how I got to Notre Dame, and uh, then at the end of three years there, Jake Boss. Um, contacted me about Michigan State so I don't I don't know if there was ever a plan so to speak as far as making moves but I did know that I had a goal of being a division one head coach and when I well when, if any opportunity came up and there were opportunities that I turned down as well um, I kind of measured them against my goals of being a division one head coach if it took me closer to that or uh, further from that so that's kind of how I made those decisions and that was the path and yeah it was like a at one year I think I filled out taxes in four states and <laughs> it was a, it was a wild wild like a little bit of a gypsy lifestyle I lived out of my truck I never had more stuff that I could fit in my truck and 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 then when I got to Michigan State to answer your last part of that question about staying at Michigan State I got here and I think I was thirty. Uh, let's see, I would have been 31 years old, and um, I said, okay, well, this is a full-time job, it's it's stable, uh, or as stable as I thought it could be, and I, I want to buy a house and settle down, and <clears throat> at that point, I was still single, and uh, you know, I loved it here, I love it, still love it here, and so I, I settled down here, so to speak, you know, and um, quit living out of my truck, bought a house, all that stuff, and then uh, 2014, um, met my wife and that's really, you know, she's from Detroit. And so it's, it's been terrific to stay here. That's great. I, I love asking questions like that because I just don't, I, I think it's so, it's such an intriguing job. It's always been an intriguing job to me. And when I, when I coached, I, I felt like it was a dream job. Like there was nothing cooler for me than telling people, I'm a college baseball coach, and I'll like a follow-up <laughs> question like, "What else do you do?" It's like, no, it's a that's a job. It's a it's a real job. Um, but your your path is we there's so many similarities in our path on, on so many ways. I, I had no idea what I was going to do when I graduated. I saw my, my actual uh, where I went to school. I was still finishing up school when I after I played, and I saw the head coach in the bathroom one day. I was in a locker room like after I worked out. Uh, you know, I'm in a urinal, like the head coach walks in, and I didn't really think he especially liked me that much in the in the years I was there, but I said to him, like, hey, uh, I'm thinking about getting into some coaching, and just kind of wanted to see, do you know anybody? I, I was thinking like a 15U travel team or whatever, and he's like, at that time, Duquesne only had a head coach, one assistant, and a, and a volunteer that would show up a couple days a week. And I didn't know anything about the rules about coaches, and he's like, well, you can come help me if you want. And and from there, I was like, now and then all of a sudden, coaching became an option, and, uh, and and it was just cool how a lot of stuff worked out. Now with you, Young Harris, that's another thing that's really intriguing to me. So I had heard stories about Young Harris. <laughs> Everybody I, has. Yes, I I once knew somebody who coached at Young Harris 
Uh, Jeremy Plexico, you guys probably missed each other by a handful of years uh, there. We missed each other, but I do know I do know Jeremy. So, uh, <laughs> and he was still there when it was a junior college as well. And you're right, it was a factory, like freaking pumping out pro guys and and Division One guys like no other JUCO. And I had just heard that that was the hardest place on earth to work, and like just how hard you work, guys. But like you said, it was it was like the expectations. You're going to be here for a couple for a year or two. You're going to work your ass off, and then I'm going to get you a job somewhere. And he did it, and the guy got people jobs. Um, can you kind of talk about what it was like there, just for people that are interested in getting in to college coaching? And I'm asking this because I think that a job like Young Harris would be beneficial for so many people because you learn a lot. You're with a guy that is going to work you very, very hard, but you're going to get something you're going to get a good job out of this, and you're also going to establish a work ethic, and you're going to meet people, and there are going to be so many benefits yeah. from it. Can you just kind of talk about what that year was like? And, like, when you say that, when he said to you, you're going to be here for two years, you won't be able to handle it longer than that, and then I'll get you another job, and basically after one year you're like, i got to get out of here, it's, it's time to go. Like, for people that are listening to this that, that have never coached in college before, what is that like? Like a, a college baseball coach that works hard, what does that mean? What are you doing? What, what's your time being spent on? Oh, my gosh. The, there, the amount of stories that I have from young Harris, is, it's endless. Because I, Rick Robinson, I hope he listens to this, uh, he, he's, he's one of the best, if not the best, baseball coach I've probably ever been around. And X's and O's wise, you know, maybe he was good at that, but his his sweet spot was motivating and organizing and um, uh, just making getting a team to play how he wanted them to play, which he knew would be successful. And you know, when he when he gave when I when I interviewed that job, I had no idea what I was asking for, and the interview consisted of two questions he said are you can you throw good bp and i said yes and he said are you in shape and i said yes and he said all right good you got the job and <laughs> what? i had no i had no idea what the, i had I, I had no idea what those two questions like where they were coming from and he explained it to me later about the bp and how you know if you miss x number of times in a bp session you extrapolate that over a week, over a month, over a semester, how many swings that takes from guys and how, why that's important. And, um, you know, being in shape, you know, I was 26 at the time and, um, you know, 26, you're in your prime. And, you know, we worked from, I mean, it really wasn't an off, you were kind of on call all the time, 24 hours a day, because we would get in the office at 7.30, we'd have a first meeting at 8.00. That would go to for about an hour. And then you do emails, letters, recruiting stuff uh, until about 10:30, and then practice would start at one. So from 10:30 to one, you're cutting the grass, watering the field, learning how to take care of a field. I mean, he went even went so far as to get us the, the two assistants. We went to the golf course, the local golf course, and he had the golf course attendant teach us about soil and grass and how to take care of grass and stuff like that. And how to fix sprinkler heads and all that stuff. And, um, you know, then practice, you had a, we had a varsity team and a JV team. So varsity would go from like one to five and then JV would go from like five to seven, seven o'clock. You put the field to bed and then he would check. He had us check guys in, in the cafeteria because one of the, one of his uh, philosophy points was you come to junior college, get bigger and stronger or else you wouldn't have been there. You know? So, he made guys eat. We check them in the cafeteria, come back, and then we had a. Uh, he would put. He would go home, put his family to bed, and then we'd have a nighttime meeting at maybe nine o'clock, and that would be practice, personnel, recruiting, all that stuff. And then we're doing laundry, and then making sure the sprinklers are you know on cycle, and then uh, you know equipment stuff and. And at the time, I was actually, I was really dumb, and I had started my master's that same year <laughs> in a master's program, so I was doing an online master's program, so when I get done with laundry about 1 a.m., I started in on my master's program, and and then when we lifted weights, the JV team 
would lift at 6 a.m. And so you're there opening up the weight room. And so it's just kind of one of those years where you're, I didn't sleep very much. And he was really tough on you as far as like making sure you're prepared, organized, executing. Um, and man, he was good. He was really good and really tough to work for. But like I said, like I still talk to him to this day and he's, he, there's a reason why he won so many games. I mean, on the team, when I was there, probably our fifth or sixth best player was Charlie Blackman. And, uh, you know, there was, there was guys, there was guys on that team that that team could have competed in the division one conference. Um, but one of the things you know, talk about meeting people, you said when I was there, I didn't, I didn't realize how many people I would talk to because everybody wanted to recruit our players. Um, so getting calls from all these four-year coaches, you start making connections and you start making friendships and, and those paid off in the long run for me, you know, to be able to, you know, when jobs came open, do you know this guy? And they, you know, it's the connections of it was, was really big. Uh, as far as like guys getting into it, it's invaluable to be at a junior college or a program where you have to do everything um, because you learn everything. And, uh, you know, like, we, we, he, his philosophy was we're going to run this JUCO like a Division One program. We only got three people, but we're going to run it like a Division One program. So from statistics, press releases, sports information, website, recruiting, field maintenance, equipment, sponsorships. We had a Dean Marine sponsorship, and we're a junior college. Like, so he made sure that, that we knew how to do everything. Um, and, and there was, I worked with two guys while I was there, one guy named Jeremy Bowles, who he's out of baseball now, and then uh, Josh Jordan, who's the recruiting coordinator at Duke now. Um, and so those guys, they experienced the same thing I did. It was tough, man. It was tough. <laughs> that, uh, you know, 25-year-old 20, me would be like, this is awesome. Let's sign me up for this. 35-year-old me with three kids at home is, like, impossible impossible to do but it sounds great i mean as a young coach i can't it's hard to imagine anything much better than that and i i don't know the whole list but i know just with my limited circle a number of guys that basically came through there and where they've ended up and it's like he pumped out coaches at high levels just like he did players and like charlie blackman and like nick markakis is a is a young harris guy right Yep. I mean, there are major yeah. leaguers that you've heard of <laughs> that come out of the junior college yeah. program, and that's that's unusual even for a Division One program. There was there was a re, we had a pitcher, a side armor on the team named Corey Guerin, who's a big league reliever. Um, I mean, the catcher that year was Corey Kemp, who went on East Carolina and was Conference USA Player of the Year that year. Um, I don't know. There there was a lot. There was a lot of good players that came through. There, there was a lot of guys that were. <clears throat> there was even some guys. There was a guy named Drew O'Neill who played on that team that was a tr he was a bounce back from Wake Forest. He pitched just a little bit for us. Went to Penn State, and the next thing you know, I think he was a sixth round pick. And you know, th his philosophy on recruiting was really, really interesting. And more than his philosophy, his how he um, executed that philosophy with like confidence and conviction and everything. He was really convincing. He was an excellent recruiter. Um, he taught me a lot of what I know about recruiting. And, um, yeah, he was, he, he I still look back and I go, I don't, I mean, it was $25,000 a year to go to that junior college and we had five scholarships. I don't know how we did it or he did it. I don't know. He, he was just really good. Can we talk about the recruiting a little bit? I mean, did you guys have a lot of transfers, a lot of Division One kickbacks that were only there, you know, for a shorter period of time so that the money wasn't a big deal? Did you have mostly high schoolers that you had two years to develop into these, you know, because I remember the guys at Young Harris, like you had big physical bodies on that field. Um, I, I went to that campus once. <laughs> I think I was at Winthrop, and I drove down for a camp. First of all, had no idea that it was – as much in the middle of nowhere as it is, yep. uh, absolutely middle of nowhere in Georgia. But also, like the I, that camp that I went to, there were hundreds of kids going through there, and every one of them got a legitimate 
opportunity to be in front of probably 30 college coaches, and it was it was probably the most well-run camp I ever went to. And I came away from that thinking, like, holy crap, like this is everything that I that I that I've heard it was as far as organization goes and everything else. But the recruiting part of it, can you talk about the recruiting part? And maybe you said that that's you learned a ton about recruiting there. Like what? What was the philosophy? What was the philosophy to get those guys in there that, that made that program what it was? Well, we did, the first part was we did not have very many kickbacks from D1s. Like, he, he wanted, what his, he wanted was, he wanted two years. He told the guys who recruited him, you come here for two years. You don't come for one and leave. You need two years. And once you have two years with this program, then you'll be ready for whatever is next. And so he didn't take a lot of Division One transfers. I think we had, we, I think maybe three on that team. Um, so all of them were high school. Almost all of them were high school guys. And as what he was looking for, <laughs> he would say to me, "I need a sheet of paper, an Excel spreadsheet with every kid in the state of Georgia that's six four or taller that pitches." You need that list. I need it, and we need to be talking to them every week. And so his his rule was: you need to be talking to seventy. You need seventy phone calls a week. Um, so ten different kids every night, seven nights a week, and you're just combing the bushes to find every kid that's six four or taller. And he said, if we get if we recruit fifteen of those guys every year, a couple of them will quit because they can't handle of it, handle it. A couple of them won't be any good, and then maybe five or six of them will end up being good. And if we have five or six every year that are good, we'll have 10 or 12 on a team, we'll win. And so that's how we recruited the pitching. He didn't really care about repertoire, about stuff. Like, he wanted guys that were big, that were athletic. And then that was it. That was kind of the and – they, and they had to be able to handle it. Um, Position-wise, recruiting philosophy was um, he wanted someone skilled behind the plate. He didn't care about body size or talent level. He wanted someone skilled. And then the rest of the positions, he wanted athletes. Um, it, it, well, I should be more specific. He said, he, he said I need a one, one outstanding tool. If you give me one outstanding tool, we'll take them. So, you know, a six nine runner was not outstanding. A six five, six six runner outstanding. Didn't care what the, what else they did. He he teach them how to be successful within the program. So, you know, it was it was a lot of big guys. It was a lot of really fast guys. It was a lot of hard throw, big hard throwers. <laughs> and more than the recruiting, I would say that he he was the only coach I've ever been around where his coaching kind of overcame the recruiting. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know how, you know, he would take those pitchers and I don't know what he, ta I don't know if he taught him much about how to throw a breaking ball or how to throw a changeup or whatever, but mentally he could get into a spot where they could compete and win. And, uh, uh, the rest of it was, I mean, to, to run a practice, I was, the first year I was there, when I was there, the first fall we spent like the first two or three days practicing how to practice. We had no balls, no nothing. It was how do you wear your uniform? How do you come to the field? How do you line up? How are we going to take ground balls between innings? How are we going to put the tarp on? How are we going to run? How are we going to fix the field? I mean, like it was, it was incredible to watch. And then once the expectation was set and the and he everybody had their job, then you're expected to do it. And he held those guys to a high standard, and they did it. If they didn't do it, he made it really tough on them. But, uh, man, once it got going and those guys started winning, like it was – I mean, at one point I think we remember winning maybe 30 games in a row. Um, it, was just, it was just a really neat place to be a part of. Wow. Was, was he ever – So I know he was tough on you guys, and it, and it sounds like he was, you know, expected a lot out of the players as well. There's, he he's like a different era of a coach. There aren't a lot of those guys around anymore. Now there's, you know, coaches are expected to. I don't want to say coddle, but they're, but coaches are expected to not be that tough on players. Coaches are expected to, especially at, at like high school levels and whatever. Like, um, 
I don't know, being tough on a player is not the norm. At, at this point, it's hard. if you don't find a lot of guys that are that way, if you're like that as a, as a coach, no matter what age you are, you're considered an old school coach. If you're if you're hard on guys and have a lot of expectation, was he ever apologetic to you guys, to the coaches or players? Like, I know I'm really asking a lot of you guys, but I but this is gonna be the best for you. Like almost like a little motivational thing, or was he just like, this no. is how it's gonna be, and if you can't handle it, then you need to get out of here. No, he didn't apologize to us at all, ever. Uh, he, no, he did. After I had moved on, I saw a much different side of him, and that's when he, you know, we had more talks about the stuff that, that, that he put us through. But, you know, in the moment when you were there, the expectation was set, and, uh, no, he, there was no apologizing. He, he, he held a very, very high standard, and I loved it. I, I loved it, and it was just really difficult day after day after day after day. Um, and you, you know, and the players—it was funny because the players saw us getting it worse than they had it. And when I say getting it worse, you know, he would, uh, you know, I remember hitting fungos one day to catchers like plate to plate, and you know, I'm standing at like short center field hitting fungos to the catchers and. And I kept hitting a couple, I hit a few balls over their heads and, you know, he's just wearing me out about wasting their time and wasting the practice time and I need to be prepared and, you know, if I'm going to do that, might as well get a machine and like just killing me on the field in front of everybody. And, uh, but you, after the practice, I go, you know what? He's probably right. He's, he's definitely right. You know, I hit too many balls over their head. They're just standing there looking at me. So next time I get a machine and it goes better and but he was just um, you know he was, he didn't apologize for, for for his way he was in that way the most confident and convicted coach I ever knew and that was probably his secret meaning like if he said hey we're gonna do we're gonna run the bases like this and he had a super aggressive approach and he said, but he could convince, he convinced everybody that that was the best way and it was going to work. And then sure enough, it was the best way. That was the way it worked. And, but, uh, it was his conviction of doing, he, he believed in everything that he was doing, like the whole time. So he convinced everybody that that was the right way. How did that personality mesh with the players? Like what did the players think? Did the players hate him? and, like, couldn't wait to get out of there, but then later look back and say, that was the best thing for me? I mean, did he actually have a decent relationship with guys when they were on campus? If you remember that part I, of it? I, it was, it's, I think, you know, he, uh, being in Michigan State, I think I would relate him a lot to Tom Izzo um, in that super, super hard on him, and maybe the day-to-day, -day, like a kid got leaving practice in Michigan State, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to speak for the kids, but, you know, you're probably going to get it from Tom Izzo and walk away not liking him that day, but over the the macro, you're going, these guys love Tom Izzo. They love him. And I, I having stayed in touch with a number of players from Young Harris, I say they love they love what they went through with, with Rick Robinson. Like, he's got good relationships with a lot of guys. Certainly, you know, a lot of guys that kept playing. And, um, I mean, as I mentioned Charlie earlier, like, I know he's done a couple of things with him even since he's, you know, become a, a big league all-star and a superstar. The junior college coach that I coached for, it was my second job. It was in Iowa. And um, that's kind of how my two years was there where he, he was very hard on players. He was very hard on me. But I, but I, when I look back at it, like that was the turning point in my coaching career. I think going into that job, I, I knew a fair amount about baseball, but did I know how to coach? Like looking back at it, I really, I didn't, I, and I didn't. Nor did I necessarily have a well-rounded philosophy in all parts of the game. And I felt like I left there after two years, you know, very prepared for whatever I was going to get into, and and took a lot of things with me from him that I'll never forget. And, and like his relationship with players and how hard he was on guys. Um, you know, one of the hard things for me as a young assistant was to reconcile 
how to be hard on your players but still care about them to where you don't lose them. You know what I mean? Like you, you yeah. your players need to know, and maybe it's more so now than it was 15 years ago, but but your players need to know that you care about them or else they're not going to take uh, – how, however hard you are on them, they're not going to take it well, and they're not going to get anything out of it. You're actually you're, you might end up pushing some of them away. You're going to end up uh, just losing some guys. Whereas I think if the players know that, like a Tom Izzo situation, that this guy really cares about me, and he's trying to get he's trying to make me a better person, then you 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 just get a different level of sure. of uh, of work ethic and a, and a different level of production out of a guy. And and that was a hard thing for me to kind of reconcile as a young coach, but. I think as I've gotten older, and especially as I've stepped away from baseball for a couple of years, I, I, I think I have a better perspective of that stuff now. Um, but it's yeah. always an interesting thing to me to talk about and listen to kind of how other guys do it and what things that other people have been through. I want to kind of switch gears on you, Graham, a little bit, and I want to talk about uh, you've been – you were a catcher in college. You've coached catchers for a long time. And catching the catching position is something that has changed a lot recently uh, from what you see in Major League Baseball, and I'm sure it's trickling down to every other level as well. And, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about it. Um, some things that are popular now and that you see a lot on social media, you see that the catching gurus are, are pushing, and, and again, you see Major League statistics uh, and, and why guys in the big leagues are doing what they're doing, but you see a lot of extra movement with catchers that are receiving the baseball. You see a lot of one knee catching. Um, and I think it's a topic that's interesting to, to a lot of people, especially people that like to, that, that, that notice these changes and, and want to find out why and want to dig deeper and find out if this is really the way to go about it. I'm just kind of curious for you as a, as a long-time catching guy, just what your uh, w- when you first started getting introduced to this kind of stuff, you first started seeing it, you first started hearing about it. Um, you know, did you also make those changes with your catchers? Like, do you have are, are most of your guys receiving the ball on one knee now, where the focus went more from blocking and throwing to receiving? You know, do your guys have all the glove movement that you see from a lot of these big leaguers, or is it different in college at the college level with college umpires and the way that they're judged among you know with their boss and things like that? Um, is has the game has the catching game in college changed a lot for you from when you played and first started coaching and, and to what you're teaching right now at Michigan State? Uh, it's, I don't think it, it hasn't changed a ton with how we coach um, because the fundamentals I think of of receiving are the same. It's the the execution of how to do it has gotten a little bit different. Um, you know, when I, when I played college, I played for a guy named Dave Pastors, who was a, a catcher himself, was very good, and back in the late 90s, and he, he says, okay, here's the deal, like, when you catch, you, gotta, you have to anticipate each pitch being thrown six inches off the ground. If you do that, then you're most likely going to be working from bottom up on everything. Um, from there, I mean, that, this was back in the 90s when it was, you know, there were, you know, I remember Javi Lopez was kind of uh, one of the standard setters. He was a huge guy, would sit real wide, uh, chest back, and he had like you know, six foot arms. Like he was, he, he caught very different than what you see today, um, but he, he could get underneath the low because he was so big. So it, there's, I think, body type affects it. Um, now, with the metrics and the strike zone um, stuff, I, yeah, certainly it's changed a lot. I don't know. I haven't, I have not talked to enough big league catchers and or big league umpires uh, to know what's right. But I do know that it, it appears more strikes are being stolen today. I the thing that I'm curious about is, like you said in your question, a lot of the extra movement. Um, it, it, it's an exaggeration of catching from the bottom up, and I think it's just the movement that's exaggerated that's the difference. You know, there were guys in the 80s, 90s, I mean, heck, 
go back to like Tony Pena in the 80s, he caught on one knee, albeit a different style. But then nobody caught on one knee, and now everybody's back to a knee, which, in my opinion, when you go to the knee, all that is doing is getting your receiving arm closer to the pitcher and lower to the ground. And, you know, guys, flexibility plays a, a role in that. If a guy is very flexible and he can get to that spot with his glove, you know, on his two feet, great. Um, the other thing that one knee catching does is it, it takes a lot of, a lot of the, um, wear and tear or, um, the tiredness out of your legs. I think I didn't, I wasn't in style, so I didn't do it. So I've never caught a nine inning game trying to do it, but from what I've been told by our guys is that it's much more comfortable. Um, I, I think in the big leagues, those guys are going to be one of the guys on base. I think it's great if they can do it. it I think it's up for debate whether it's smart. Um, you know, the skill set is going to be the predictor of that. Um, I, it's really difficult, really difficult for us to get an 18-year-old catcher in here and start talking about hey, the guy in first is getting one knee and uh, we'll catch, block, and throw from there. I mean, they don't, they usually don't even know where to put their gloves. So you're, you need to start with the basics, and the basics being still when the pitch is released, you need to be loose and thinking and anticipating below. Or two strikes when you get in a secondary stance, you're still doing the same thing. So I don't. I, I've watched all the clips that probably everybody everybody else has on social media, and I think the guys that move the ball a lot when they come up through the ball a lot, if you if you really look at their game, they're flashy guys. You know, a lot of flashy guys, and I think and I don't know if umpires like that or don't, um, or if it gets them. Or not, I think it might. Um, but you know, what, you know, at our level, I don't know a lot of guys that have that kind of style to their game that can get away with that. Um, so uh, it's changed. But for us, I, I mean, at the big league level, it certainly looks a lot different for us. It hasn't changed all that much. If you were coaching at the high school level. Or if you were advising guys who are coaching at the high school level, would you, uh, just thinking about receiving, would you be asking your catchers or advise people to ask their catchers to, to move the ball as much as you see big leaguers? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you just a little bit of a, I'm going to digress a little bit here. People usually ignore my Twitter account, which is great. Um, <laughs> it's probably the best thing. But I, I reposted a video, I retweeted a video of Victor Caratini, maybe, a, I don't know, a couple of weeks back. And, and, and I, I made a comment about his receiving. I, I didn't think it was very good. Basically, I thought that he was late to the ball. And when you're, when you're not beating the ball to the spot and you're late to it, your glove is being carried out of the zone, right? Like you're, you're, you're setting up maybe uh, low and middle and the ball ends up low and away and you end up, you reach for that ball and you're late to it. So your glove gets pulled out of the zone. Well, I thought he was late to balls and then he was pulling everything back middle, middle. Like not just in the edge of the strike zone, but he was pulling everything back middle middle, and I just thought I thought it looked bad. And he in, in this little clip that somebody else posted, you know, he was getting calls. But frankly, I thought all of them were strikes anyway, except one. Like if he just caught it where where it was, I didn't think he necessarily stole a bunch of strikes there. But that for whatever reason, that tweet went viral, and it you know it was got hundreds of thousands of of uh, interactions or whatever, and it was just it was crazy. But what was the, what was what were they? Uh, what was the majority commenting on that it was that you were being too hard on him and that it was fine? Well, there were a couple. So I've had Jeff Fry on this podcast before, and Jeff Fry reposted it, and maybe another Jeff Fry follower, another she gone <laughs> hashtag she gone person, like retweeted it, and that's what got it all started. And they were basically because my comment was something like, "Is is this really good receiving in 2020? It just doesn't." Like, nothing about this looks good, and I don't see how this is going to buy any strikes. Obviously, Twitter, you're limited in characters, but I reposted it because I just I couldn't see that buying extra strikes. I couldn't see that fooling an umpire on a borderline pitch. 
And if anything, I just saw it like pissing umpires off. And, and I think most of my following is probably a lot of high school type coaches. And, and I, what my, my main concern with a lot of what I post on social media is just, I think there are some, some things that are being taught or that maybe even that work at higher levels that are just, they're not good for youth baseball. And that's one thing that I just, I, I, I personally wouldn't, don't, I wouldn't teach that to catchers at this point, pulling a, a, you know, a ball out of the strike zone back to middle, middle and someone else. So at first, like the she gone type of people were like, yeah, that's garbage. And then, and then of course you have other like catching gurus that came in and said, well, according to statistics, these guys are stealing more strikes. Like, I don't know, I don't know where they're, where they're, where they find their statistics, but more catchers now are getting more balls out of the zone to be called strikes. And, and these Victor Caratini is apparently in the top half of, of catchers receiving as far as like strike percentage. And I don't know, maybe that, that's the only thing I could, that's one of the things that somebody posted. But anyway, uh, to kind of bring this all together, it was, it was a lot. And then just several other people retweeted it and then it just went crazy people that had no idea who I was or people that are fighting amongst themselves or whatever. But it seemed like there was the old school type of people that thought that said, yeah, this isn't, this is, this is not good. And the new school type of guys that were like, well, well, it's working. But my question for you is that at the college level, I don't believe that there's the scrutiny on the umpires. Like a major league umpire is going to probably have a review after almost every game or after every period of time with, with someone and they've got to be held to very high standards. So at some point, they're going to have to overcome what the catchers are doing and call a ball a ball and a strike a strike or else they're going to they're going to lose yeah. their job, right? At college, I know you have people that evaluate, and maybe it's the same now. Maybe since I've left the college game, maybe there's enough video in college baseball that the evaluation for an umpire is the same at, at your level. But even at lower levels of college where there's not all the video and in high school baseball where you basically have um, – an evaluator sitting in the stands, essentially, that's evaluating your strike zone and all that, like, they're, they're, that can't be the same, and I just can't believe that there's a benefit to younger level coaches, or younger level, yeah, younger level, coaches of younger levels teaching their catchers to do what the big leaguers are doing, and that's part of this podcast, is just to teach people and, and to give people some insight, so I guess, uh, to, to again, to bring this all together, if you were advising someone coaching at a low level of college, where the where video is not prevalent like it is for you guys in the Big Ten, or if you were talking to a high school coach or the coach of a middle school team or, or a younger, a 15U travel team, is this something that's good for catchers to get into in your estimation, or is it going to do more harm than good because the umpires are going to say, I don't like you pulling that ball in like that, so I'm going to shrink my zone on you. Does that make sense? Is, is this something oh, yeah. that's good for yeah. youth catchers or something that maybe youth catchers should overlook? I would say as a blanket statement, uh, yeah, they, they sh- it's not something that should be taught to youth players, high school and below. And I think there's many, many reasons. One is the majority of the kids are not going to have the skill level to do it. The the second part would be um, the the umpires are pr- probably you know certainly big league umpires are very very good. And as you go down levels, they're not as good. And I think also you're going to, um, I, in my experience, you run into a lot more, uh, how should I say it, like e- egos might be a little bit more affected with a high school kid who is who's jerking the ball around. And then coaches start saying, hey, that's a strike. Look where he caught it. And I think it's going to do more harm than good. Um, you know, umpires, as they're, they're people too, and they are as objective as they can be. But they also, just like players and coaches, can be can be swayed in a direction based on a number of things. So, <clears throat> if uh, if as a catcher you're jerking the ball from out to, outside the zone to inside the zone and then holding it, questioning the umpire. You do that enough, and it breaks down, the I think, that pitch or the catcher-umpire relationship. And, you know, the other part is, is that, they, you know, I've seen a lot of high school catchers, and the first place I would start is what you mentioned earlier, just beating the ball to the spot because the goal is um, – is to catch the ball where it's where it's thrown, 
And if you can do that consistently and like stick it there, you're, that, that's going to be the best look. If you start moving your glove from below the ball, catching it on the way up, when guys get to throwing harder or more movement, there's going to be an injury factor in there too. Um, where you move up too quick on a ball that's low and it catches your thumb, or you go, you try to get outside the ball and catch it coming back in and it gets your wrist. Um, so the answer is no, I would not be teaching that to the young guys. And statistics might show in the big league level that it does steal more strikes. Um, but, you know, I don't know, I can't think of a good analogy to, to another pro sport. You know, maybe like teaching high school kids to shoot like James Harden with a step back, it, he, he's a good shooter and it goes in a lot, but he's also a really big guy that's perfected a craft. It's not, it's kind of apples and oranges. Um, so no, now in the, in the college level, I don't know. Yeah, I think, I think it's a big deal that, that catchers establish a rapport with an umpire and based on initial conversations, you know, we get the same umpires a lot and they get to know them, but if you're just getting to know a guy, you can kind of feel, you know, is me jerking this ball around and questioning if that's a strike, is he, does he take kindly to that or not? And if he doesn't, it's not a good idea to keep doing it um, because his strike zone is the only one that matters. It's not what I think is a strike of the coach or the pitcher. It's, it's his strike. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a difficult conversation, but um, – at the, at the high school level, no, I don't think kids are ready for that. It's an interesting debate to me, Graham, because I, I just don't believe that that part of – there are certain things I just don't think have changed at, at youth levels, and that's one of them is that – so what, what I coached catchers in the past, and, and when I would coach a catcher, basically it was, like you said, you want to try to catch the ball where it is. You want to beat the ball to the spot so that you can make that pitch look as good as you can. But you're not trying to make it look better than it is necessarily. And a big reason for that is because of, of what you said. That umpire that umpire is going to hear a lot more crap from the dugout and from the stands if the if 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 the catcher makes every ball look better than it actually is. If the umpire is calling a ball that's out of the strike zone a ball, but that catcher brings it back into the zone and holds it there, and he holds it long enough for everyone to see it, and that it's called a ball, that umpire is going to catch a lot more flack from the stands and from the dugout. And it's just hard for me to believe that that umpire is going to be on your side as the catcher, yeah. whereas I think if you just do a good job of receiving the ball where it is, and I would tell my catchers that if the ball's a ball, just catch it and throw it back. You don't need to hold it there. Don't hold it there yeah. unless it's a strike. And even if it's a strike, just you don't need to hold it there for three seconds. Hold it for, like, maybe a second, just long enough to, like, let, everybody, let the umpire take a good look and then throw it back. You don't need to make a show of it. You don't need to make a spectacle. You don't need to, like, to me, the longer you hold it there, you're, after it's called a ball and you're still holding it, uh-huh. you're telling your coach, umpire called it a ball, but I thought it was a strike. Yeah. And I think that's, that's, uh, that, that's what your body language is saying. And I, just, it's, I also believe that it's important for catchers to develop a good relationship with umpires. And it's, that, to me, is not the building block of a good relationship. It's to make everybody in the whole, in the whole park question these pitches. Uh, anyway, I think it's an interesting debate and something I was I was anxious to talk to you about. What about on the hitting side of things? There's so much noise on social media, which I know every young kid is, every young baseball player is hearing. Uh, there's there's just, there's a lot. There's a lot for a young hitter to hear, and there's a lot to potentially confuse a young hitter. Are you teaching hitting much differently now than you did? Uh, well, even when you were a player, like it, what you were taught at Liberty, is it being taught a lot differently now? Do you teach hitting much differently now in 2020 than you did in 2004 or five or whenever you had a chance to first work, uh, first be sort of be be a hitting coach in college? Is it, or have things changed? And I, I don't mean like have obviously I'm sure you've progressed as a coach, but have general philosophies changed? Is like generally speaking what works and what makes a good hitter a good hitter has that really changed do, do kids should kids kids have different objectives now than they had in 2005 that's a good question that's a really good question um <laughs> i i think um the real answer probably not a lot it hasn't changed a ton and i 
I, I, although there are significant parts that have changed, when you, you say you mentioned Liberty, uh, I, I played for a really, really good uh, hitting coach at Liberty named Jeff Edwards, and he was only in the college game for maybe four years, but uh, he's been a, a scout at various levels for, I don't know, maybe the last 25 years. Um, he was he was all about um, – he really wanted guys to lift the ball, you know, get – to, to make make the outfielders chase it, and um, so even this is back in the late '90s. Now again, th- this is a different. The, um, the the controls have changed. You know, the the bat has changed, the ball has changed. So these were really like really uh, the bats were really hot. You know, like everybody was hitting a lot of home runs. So that was part of it. So there was a lot of, like, if you were rolling over ground balls, that was no good. Um, the strikeout wasn't a huge issue. Um, but <clears throat> as I moved on in my coaching career, I learned different season styles. And I kind of, I've changed a little bit as far as, I changed a little bit after I got done playing in maybe the middle of my coaching career about viewing the strikeout as, a quote unquote easy out and being able to limit easy outs is a good thing. Um, meaning strikeouts and lazy fly balls. So that was a focus. Then it shifted back to how are you getting to the strikeout? Who's striking out? Uh, are the, are the thumpers striking out or are the speed guys striking out? Are the, um, you know, so that, that's different. Um, Certainly, video and metrics are very, very different. But they're saying, you know, the, the metrics are saying today what guys were saying back in the late '90s, which is get the ball in the air. I mean, it does stand. To, it does stand to reason. You want to try to hit the ball where there are less fielders and there's more grass. And if you can do that, you probably have a better chance. But how you get there, meaning how hard you hit the ball. Me giving the, the defense the littlest time to react, that's still a good way to hit. Launch angle, uh, I think that, that phrase, when that came in, almost everybody misunderstood it, I think. I certainly did at the very beginning until I started breaking into it, and I would rather, I use the, the term ball flight now because that's a more accurate depictor of what's happening. Um, everybody knows when the ball leaves the bat at a certain angle, it's good. And when it leaves the bat at the other, another angle, it's bad. Um, so that, I think guys come to college now smarter about the data, the metrics, uh, what is being taught, but they're not any better at executing what they're trying to execute. You know, they still need work on what kind of hitter are you, how are you going to develop uh, as, as a whole? What parts of the game do you need to develop? And then how are you going to execute that in an approach when you walk to the plate? That's that's never changed. That's always been the same. Um, so it, it, it's changed a little bit, but overall, I mean, not, not a wholesale change. It, it, but if you look at Twitter, it appears as though there's been a wholesale change. Um, and I don't, I don't think that there – I don't know if there has been. Maybe there has been, but I don't think there needs to be. That's why I like to ask these questions because I, I want – and I don't know if what we're talking about is is the truth. You know, if people would yeah. consider this the truth, if people would consider what we're – what. Uh, your perspective correct or not, I don't know. But I guess I, I I know what people scream about on Twitter, but I also know that college coaches don't do don't scream on Twitter. They don't. And, and pro guys, for the most part, don't scream on Twitter. So for the most part, the people that are the loudest on Twitter are not college coaches and they're not high school – I'm sorry, they're not high school – I'm sorry. They're not college coaches. They're not pro coaches. They're, they're guys that coach other levels. They're guys that run facilities. They're guys that – um, that, that maybe coach at lower levels that are trying to do things differently or do it like the big leaguers do or like what they see. But you don't often hear the voices of those coaches. And I, that's why I wanted to, to ask about it because 
obviously there's more information available, but with more information, I'm sure you can tweak your philosophy a little bit, but I, it's hard for me to believe that, 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 the, that the numbers that are available now, the data that's available now has made that many people at high level say, hey, what I was doing 10 years ago was completely wrong, and, and now like there, this, there's a whole new way to teach hitting that I, you know, I, I, was, I was so far off. Because I think yeah. it's for, to a point, like if, you, if you've always had success, if your hitters have hit for a good average, and I think people have, you wouldn't think this on, uh, according to Twitter again, but I think people have always liked extra base hits. <laughs> yeah. like people, there's, but there's no time when people have like frowned on doubles and homers um, as hitting coaches. And I, I just, I, I think it's important to talk about because I want to present people with, so I guess, sort of a level-headed view of just of the of baseball in 2020 and what it's really about. And, and have you, was there any statistic or I guess any data metric that you kind of got familiar with that made you? Once you once you kind of learned what this is about, like it made you tweak your philosophy a little bit. Um, yeah, there's a couple, and they they're not the metrics that you might be thinking. Um, one was when I was at James Madison. This is back in like uh, oh seven. Um, th- th- that's when I first heard about quality at bats and defining what that means. And the offenses we had at James Bass were very, very good. Um, and so defining what a quality of bat means, that, that was an eye-opener to me because it's like, well, okay, well, the how it's about how, when you walk up to the plate, how can you help your team win? And there's a lot of different ways to do that. And um, one of maybe ten areas where you can do that is a hit. Uh, so there's nine other areas of success that you can have and being able to teach the guys what those are and how they can implement those. And really, then when I got to Michigan State, it became, we started, I started looking at when we win, what are the common factors um, offensively that we do? And in like 2013, maybe, um, no, it was 13 or 14. I look back at three years or three seasons of data and the, stati- the statistical significance of base runners on base per game was there was a huge significance between the 14th and 15th base runner. Um, I believe when we got 14 guys on base, we won it like a 63% clip. And when we got the 15th guy on base, we won it like a 92% clip. Wow. And so if you work backwards from if 15 runners gives you the best chance to win, statistically speaking, how do you get 15 guys on base? And so if you work backwards from that, the quality of bats come into play, approaches per player come into play, um, recruiting to that well, who you need, you, like, are there on? Are there guys that are always on base that have no power that you're recruiting? Well, we need one of those. Um, certainly, you got to have some thumpers. You got to have some speed guys. You got to have some guys that are just uh, tough outs. Um, and so, I think those two numbers, the, the quality of bat uh, measurement, our goal per game is 525. Um, an individual goal would be 575. If they're reaching those goals, we're going to win. And um, so, you know, like back at when I was in Notre Dame, we had a kid named Brett Lilly. And Brett, I'm sure there's probably some college guys listening to that, and they're thinking, oh, man, I remember that guy. He was like 5'8", maybe 5'7", a little left-handed hitter, <clears throat> tiny guy. But he still holds the NCAA record for hit by pitches. And he, I think he hit 280 his senior year, but his um, quality of bat percentage was like almost 700. Um, when he hit the ball, he usually hit it hard. Uh, he got, he, every. it seemed like every at bat he was in, he was six pitches or better. And he got hit, I think, 37 times that season. Mm-hmm. So he was either walking, getting hit, getting a six pitch AB. The guy was a, just a terror. But you think, oh, he hits 280, 
he's not that good of an offensive player. And the fact of the matter was, he was unbelievable as an offensive player. So trying to find niches for guys, um, how they can, what their skill set is, and how they can best uh, maximize that, their role, and then putting a team or lineup of guys like that together, I mean, that's, that's kind of metric-wise, that's what I'm looking at. As far as exit velo and all that stuff, I mean, it's probably controversial for me to say the acts of velo, I'm not really concerned about it all because how you get there, you, know, you can do like the happy Gilmore run up and hit the ball, you know, 95 miles an hour. That doesn't tell me if you can recognize pitches. It doesn't tell me if you can, um, actually when you swing the bat, are you going to hit the ball? I mean, those are important parts to the game of hitting. Um, so exit velo, it's nice to have a guy that's strong, but I think you can build that onto a player in a college program. You can develop that in a college program if the other fundamentals are in place. You know, a guy that can recognize pitches, can, can handle the strike zone. Um, when he does swing the bat, does he make contact? Those types of things. Especially if you have the Young Harris uh, weight program. <laughs> yeah, eat a lot. And we, uh, that, our strength program at Michigan State, uh, the nutrition program, there's been a lot of guys that come here and put on a lot of weight, too, and get strong. Um, yeah, that, and that really helps. Size and strength are not prerequisites to be successful in college. They sure do, they do help, though. They don't hurt. Last question, Coach Sykes, before I let you go. You might have already answered this, but out of all the data metrics that are out there, especially that young kids are focusing on, which, if there was one that you would say is the most overrated that has the least amount of correlation to actual game success, what, what would you think that would be with hitters? Uh, um, it, at, a, at a certain level, I mean, there's a sweet spot of, of an age group where, you know, when you're talking about 10-year-olds, you know, if you hit a fly ball at a 10-year-old game, there's a... 50-50 shot, they're gonna not going to catch it. So that, yeah, I don't know how, that, how correlatable that is, but if you're talking about high school, I would say the, the most overrated probably would be launch angle. And the reason I say that is because, um, you know, you, I go to all these high school games and guys hit ground balls and it's, you know, fields are not manicured that well. And a ball on the ground to the left side of the field, the guy's got to catch it, which is tough. He's got to throw it on target, which is tough. The guys at first has got to catch it. they got to do it under a certain amount of time, and the umpire's got to get a call right. I mean, those are a ball on the ground in a high school game. There's a, there's a decent chance a guy's going to find his way out base. Now, um, I don't think that's long, long range, like a good way to coach, to hit ground balls. But um, I also see guys, plenty of guys who cannot hit the ball over the fence with any regularity that are focusing on hitting the ball in the air. And, you know, I, I've, I've, I've mentioned the name already twice, but I'll use it because it's worthwhile in mentioning. Charlie Blackman, when I talked to him about hitting, I asked him about his cage routine and stuff, and he said, I'm, I'm never in a cage routine. I'm never going to hit the ball on the top of the cage, especially um, – when a guy's flipping to me or throwing me soft toss because at 50 miles an hour, if I hit it at that angle, if you extrapolate that to 95 miles an hour, it's a foul ball or a pop-up. So I need to hit the front toss, the tee, short toss, all that stuff. I need to hit at this certain level to the back of the cage. So when it is 95, it'll create a little bit more loft and it'll, you know, that's how I'm going to have my power. But you know, I see lots of kids who get in the cage and they hit the ball on top of the cage, and I think strength is an issue. Uh, velocity is going to become an issue. It's going to. I think overall, there are certainly kids that can do it, but overall, there's a lot of there's more probably bad habits that can come out of that than good habits. Was that Charlie Bra Blackman at Young Harris, or is that Charlie Blackman on the Rockies? That's him today. Okay. Two thousand. Very interesting. And, and another thing that I just, it, it's, I don't want to commit to this with an agenda necessarily, but I'd, I like to just kind of find out what other coaches are thinking and teaching because 
I mean, heck, if I've got if, if I've got a 16 year old son, I want to know what a college coach really wants, and I want to know what's important to you and what's not. And I I think these are great conversations to have. This is Graham Sykes, everybody. He's the recruiting coordinator, but also the catcher's coach, the the hitting coach, and the base running coach. We didn't really get into base running today, but uh, he's at Michigan State. Uh, a guy that's had a lot of success, a lot of places he's been, and someone with a very level head. And uh, I've really enjoyed this. It's been great. I've, I've very much enjoyed it, and I appreciate the time and all the insight that you gave us today on the podcast. Bad, Jeff. Thanks for having me.